Hey guys. Um, thanks very much for coming along. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Aaron and Dan, um, who are from Epic Games, uh, who are going to talk about um, using Unreal Engine and Blueprint to do procedural audio stuff. So I'm going to see if I can find my mouse uh, and put those guys up on the screen. And there you go, guys. Cool. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, cool. Uh, so uh, my name is Aaron McLaren, and uh, I have with me uh, one of uh, Epic's uh, technical sound designers, Dan Reynolds. Hi. Um, hey. and <laughs> uh, so uh, our plan today is to kind of do a two-parter here. It's, it's a true co-presentation. The first part is going to be uh, focused on sort of a deeper dive than you might have seen before on, on Blueprint relative to uh, Max or PD uh, programming paradigms. Um, there's tons of uh, tutorials and documentation already on, on how Blueprints work, uh, but uh, hopefully this is a little bit more geared. You, you're not going to see a presentation like this geared towards audio people and how Max works or PD works. Um, so the first part of the presentation is going to be on that by myself. Um, that's it's going to be a PowerPoint slide, and I'm going to sort of structure it with like a topic. And here's how Max does it. Here how how uh, Blueprints does it. Um, and then second part of the talk is going to be a uh, demo of a procedural music uh, system that Dan wrote uh, in UE4. And then he'll sort of do a deep dive on the actual Blueprint and how he actually uh, composed it. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I, I'll uh, start in my uh, portion of the presentation. So uh, this, as I just said, is uh, just to get Max PD users up and running. Uh, can you guys see the, the slideshow, by the way? Uh, was that a yes? Yeah, we got it now. OK. Uh, so um, yeah, so basically, do a max PD comparison to Blueprint. Um, I want to provide some context so that when Dan's presentation starts, and if you're not familiar with Blueprint, you'll actually get a sort of sense of what he's doing. And the overall goal of this, this is going to be kind of like a fly by the seat of your pants, like something that shouldn't be done in an hour sort of presentation. So the, the hope is that uh, you just get inspired uh, to go and download UE4, which is totally free. Uh, you can just download it and uh, check out some tutorials and start digging in. Because uh, the procedural audio community in academia is a big uh, group of people that I think um, I would like to see m more stuff directly plugged into game engines and doing really cool stuff in games. And I, I see that growing as a trend in the game in industry, but I, uh, I'd like to see that kind of thing happen more. And so that's uh, sort of the overall goal is to encourage you guys to, to jump into UE4. and try some stuff out. So what is Blueprint exactly? Um, Blueprint is a is a scripting language. Um, and it evolved from a uh, uh, earlier days in the Unreal uh, Development Kit, or UE3 and 2 and 1. Um, and uh, Unreal Script was a true, like a text scripting language. It had a lot of issues. But uh, the Unreal Engine always sort of appreciated the value of the scripting language. So when UE4 came out, a big thing was to come up with a more robust, more flexible, more powerful scripting language, and that uh, eventually evolved into Blueprint. Um, it has it's uh, it's a fully featured language from a deep perspective, which I'll get into. But it has a huge number of features. Uh, a team at uh, Epic adding things all the time. Um, one of the the best and uh, critical features about the uh, scripting language is that it's very very easy for gameplay scripts. Uh, gameplay code, new systems, third-party DLLs, you know, third-party libraries to extend into Blueprint. It's very easy to bind C++ behavior into into uh, Blueprint. And uh, uh, when I joined Epic a couple years ago and I started learning Blueprint, I was pleased to uh, find that there a lot of my you know previous experience doing Max and PD programming totally maps over to Blueprint scripting. And I found it to be a very enjoyable environment for music programming and interactive audio and procedural audio. So this is, uh, if you haven't seen Blueprint before, um, there may be some people out there who haven't checked it out. This is sort of what it looks like from a bird's eye view, just to kind of give you a sense of that it that it is a node-based language. It's like Max and PD in that sense. Um, you can do sort of organizational structures. You see in this picture sort of 
comments around blocks of code explaining what it does. You know, uh, you see a lot of colors. I'll explain what these kind of things mean later in the presentation, but just sort of give you an idea of what it looks like. So what this presentation is going to talk about is um, <laughs> ambitiously all these topics. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to talk through them right now, but basically it's all, all the things I could think of, and I try to think of a reasonable order to do them in. Um, but basically, you know, how you compile, how it runs, what the execution order is in this in the graph node, you know, how how the timing and threading system works in Blueprint, and and each one of these topics are going to be from the perspective of like here's how it's done in Max and here's how it's done in, in Blueprint. So in the first one, uh, c compilation and runtime. What I mean by this is like how how does the actual script execute uh, in terms of like a virtual machine or or something like that. Um, so in Max. Um, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to be giving these presentations from Max's point of view because um, I'm more familiar with Max than I am with uh, PD. It's been many years since I've done a lot of PD scripting, so I, I'm maybe a little bit behind the time on some PD stuff. So for for safety reasons and not saying something wrong, um, I'm going to sort of just do this on Max, but most of this stuff also applies to PD scripting. So anyways, this uh, GIF indicates you know a program that's actually executing um, while you're editing it. Um, this is not the way Blueprint works. Blueprint, you you write your script, you do your node programming, you write your logic and everything, and then you hit a compile button. And that actually takes all your Blueprint uh, nodes and compiles it into a kind of bytecode. Um, and then at runtime, when you push play, you see there's a little play button right there. Um, uh, let's see if you can see my mouse. I don't know. Uh, right here is the uh, uh, play button. If you were to push play here, then you'd actually run the script. So. The script isn't executing while you're editing it. I think that's a, a key distinction here. However, the compile is almost always fast, um, and uh, there's some benefits of of doing this sort of uh, compilation step for Blueprint. So the next big topic in a node-based language uh, is execution order. That's like, so you have this node graph. How do I know which nodes are evaluated in which order? Um, so in Max, uh, ex execution order is sort of bottom up, right, left, although I think it's right, left, bottom up uh, order. But uh, and in PD, if I recall, um, unless it's changed, uh, that the node execution order is based on the order that you instantiated it. Um, so uh, I have a little, if you can see that, I don't know if you guys can see it very well, but basically I have a little print statement here that shows when I hit the hit this bang here that it shows that it goes A, B, C, D, E, and F. And then course, because that's kind of annoying and you, you would might completely change your you know script logic if I moved this node over to here or something. If I move nodes around, I might change the order of execution logic, which might completely break everything. Uh, most uh, advanced Max and PD scripters have gotten used to using triggers to very carefully order the sequence of events, especially when it when it really matters. And so the second little node graph here is a, is a big giant trigger. Of course, you can abbreviate trigger with T. I just wanted to be clear for this diagram what that is. So in um, uh, Blueprint, the execution order is much more clearly defined, so you don't really ever need trigger, although you have similar sorts of constructs, which I included in this diagram here. But basically, the uh, execution order is based on a special type of pin called the execution pin. Um, and so uh, each of these nodes well, if it does something, we'll have a sort of do it uh, graph connection. And you'll see that the order always begins on some left node and then pr progresses through to the right. And you can do a similar kind of thing that the trigger does, which is which in Blueprint is called sequence. And you can say like, do this, then this, then this, then then you can add as many as you want. And there's a little button here, you could add pin. And so it'll progress through. You also have loops and things like this, which uh, Dan will show you more uh, actually applying this. But it's important that, to understand in Blueprint that execution order is very explicitly defined by the execution pin. So in threading and timing, so by threading and timing, I mean uh, sort of uh, what thread the actual script is executed on. Um, in Max, there's a, two separate schedulers. Uh, there's a event scheduler, which you can have precise control over in the um, settings um, of Max, which you can see over here on the left here is you can specify, you know, overdrive schedule, uh, scheduler mode, how, how many milliseconds between events, you know, all these kinds of things. It's really great and very powerful and clearly designed for very precise timing for music. However, it's important to, to note that this is not sample accurate event schedule timing. Um, 
Uh, but anyways, you can see right here what I would call a a, uh, a coroutine sort of support where you you have one thread uh, cooperating the, to create a, a feeling of multiple parallel threads of execution. I kind of like using delay nodes as a demo of that. So you see right here, I push the bang. And on the left here, you see a delay of 10 milliseconds, a delay of 100 milliseconds, and a delay of 500 milliseconds. And so you can see that the event scheduler will properly schedule those times out so they execute later in the graph. Um, so it's sort of a classic uh, coroutine sort of system. So in Blueprint, um, the execution, oh, I should also point out in Max that there's a, another scheduler specifically design, uh, built for audio flow, and that's the audio scheduler, the sort of DSP graph. Um, and that's, I talk about that a little bit more, but I'm not really talking about that aspect right here. I'm really more talking about the sort of logical event scheduler. In Blueprint, um, the the entire Blueprint script is executed off of the game thread. Um, this has a lot of important implications when it comes to DSP and uh, synthesis and things like that. Um, but uh, the timing, therefore, is locked to the game thread timing. Um, but, however, it does have a coroutine sort of support in its uh, what they call the event graph. The event graph is basically a coroutine type system. And so with, this is a similar sort of node structure that I've built that is uh, similar to the max uh, graph that I just showed. We have a event you know, comes in. I just use event being begin play, but you can have arbitrary events. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, then I do th a, a three sequence. This is similar to the sort of, you know, three node sequence here. Um, and I just have some delay nodes. This is, it's in the values in seconds. So it's 0.2 seconds, 0.5 seconds, and one second. And this would trigger here, then wait, and then trigger here, then wait, then trigger here. Um, of course, all at the same time. So this would go brrr, and then you would see this go 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and one second later, print ABC. Um, the, there's a markup on uh, delay sort of coroutine-based nodes that yield the execution thread with this sort of uh, uh, time symbol here. So you can sort of see at a glance if there's a sort of coroutine-ish sort of node. Um, next big topic is types, sort of like, and by type I mean like integer, float, that kind of a thing. Um, so in Max, uh, there are basically two different types. Uh, they're split between event control types and sort of audio slash matrix. I use uh, matrix as a new thing that was introduced when Jitter came along with Max. Um, but I, in this picture, you can kind of see that depending on the sort of classification of type, it colors the nodes separately. So this is the way Max colors. Hopefully you can see my mouse when I say this. Uh, but uh, this is the uh, way that the... Um, uh, audio DSP nodes are are displayed. Here's what the jitter matrix nodes connections are 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 displayed, and then here's general sort of event you know blah types. Um, the uh, uh, in terms of the event control types, there's uh, direct support for integer and float characters and lists, um, and then also messages for object methods, attributes, and things like that. And they're not really colored according to the types. Um, there's also a weird bang type um, that I always thought was strange, uh, but it's sort of kind of analogous to the execution pin, but Max is crazy land and nothing is always consistent for every object, but it's sort of roughly, uh, it's sort of tr tr traditional that there's a bang type for objects. Um, in Blueprint, there's it's ex the opposite of that. It's extremely strongly typed. Every single thing has a specific type. You can see here on the left here, I'm adding variables, which I'll talk about in a second in detail, but you can see all the different types. Every single thing in the code base that is exposed to blueprint scripting, which I'll explain more about how that happens, um, has a strong type. And so through that, you can do a lot of aw awesome like reflection and uh, uh, sort of, uh, what's that called? Uh, uh, when you drag off a pin and it does a uh, to, like a auto like tooltip context context context, context menus. yes like that right there you can see that it's oh I know that I've got a blue bool type and I start typing and it knows sort of what things that type can expect so it's pretty useful in that respect you can do a lot of uh it helps you along in that in in that domain and also you can see that the nodes are colored differently I'll talk about that in a second but you see the the red for 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 uh, bool here this is a bool and it's colored red uh, floats are colored green integers are colored blue. So all these kinds of things have different colors. So you can see in the graph at a glance what the types are as they, they go around your script. So I find it uh, to be very useful. You can also do um, uh, 
uh, oh, this is the, I think the, I think this is the wrong, wrong slide for this topic. Anyways, you can also do uh, uh, other types of things like uh, have variables at different scope and types. Like I think I have this swapped with something, so I might have that duplicated. Apologies. All right, so the next big concept is uh, objects. So what is an object in Max? Um, in Max, objects are the nodes themselves, typically. Um, even like the trigger trigger nodes, that's what this guy is, the bang node. Each of these have like sort of behaviors and state that they maintain. And in the graphics itself, you kind of treat this thing as an object. I just use tempo as an example, uh, just picked randomly. But you can see right here, tempo is a kind of message slash, slash method on the tempo object. Um, uh, different inlets are sort of different inputs to that object, and the state is internally stored, and you can turn it on and off, all these kinds of things. But the, the key thing here is that the node itself is sort of the object. Um, in Blueprint, um, I don't really have a slide for this, but Blueprint, the whole you should think of the whole script that you're composing as an object, um, almost always. Uh, nodes are almost always uh, uh, with, uh, nodes with execution pins are pretty much always some kind of function and the inlets are arguments, and, and often the inlet argument is uh, an object that is a variable that you would you would define. Um, nodes are almost always themselves stateless. Uh, they may set state on some object or component. There's this idea of an object and a component in Blueprint, which I'm not going to get into in detail, but, but basically the, there's a slight difference in ways of thinking about uh, a node graph in Blueprint versus Max. Um, Basically, nodes are almost always methods and functions with no state, and the object state itself is stored in, in explicitly in variables. So, um, in uh, so from objects, I'm going to move on to object-oriented programming, um, and by that I mean classes, inheritance, and things like that. So for Max, there's not a real uh, solid support for object-oriented programming concepts, though you you can get sort of close, just like you can kind of get object-oriented coding in C. If you are really clever, you can kind of do the same thing in Max, where you structure your, your scripts in such a way that you can have some kind of inheritance. If you cleverly use patcher arguments or things like that, you could sort of internally instantiate a different object based on some higher level object, you know, things like that. You can get sort of in that direction with Max, but it's not like a deep support for object-oriented programming. Uh, on the other hand, in Blueprint, there's a full, ob it's it's basically exactly, if, you, if you're a C++ programmer, you'll find that Blueprint sort of maps really well to C++, and not accidentally. Um, the UE4 U object LAN is very object-oriented, and sort of a lot of that stuff automatically reflects into Blueprint LAN. So you can have, you can create a new script that inherits from an actor class, and then get all the behavior of an actor, and then extend it a little bit in Blueprint, and sort of this, the idea. And similarly, in Blueprint, you can make an entirely new, fresh base class, and then make you know, new Blueprint scripts that are subclasses of that and so on. You can define interfaces in Blueprint, um, which are really helpful, like just like they are in other, you know, C++ object-oriented programming languages for polymorphism, polymorphism and things like that. Um, you also have explicit scoping of variable types. You can have private, public, and protected. They mean exactly the same thing they do in C++. Uh, so after object-oriented programming, talk about data structures. Data structures being like arrays, tables, um, things like that. So in uh, Max, there's generally uh, poor native support for a lot of different abstract data types. Um, this has always been a pain in the butt for people that do Max programming. Um, we have there is list support in Max, um, but you have to do uh, weird stuff with ZL. Um, anybody who's tried to do some stuff with ZL nodes, weird. Um, uh, you can do associated tables with the call object, which I have. Oh, it's two L's, um, so I typed it here, but whatever. Uh, basically, just short for collection, and you can have an arbitrary list of key value pairs. That's what this like sort of screenshot shot is. Um, matrices, uh, support for matrices added by Jitter has, in my opinion, dramatically improved the situation for data structures because you can have matrices and store arbitrary data in matrices. Um, and of course, there's tons of third-party object libraries that exist to compensate for this issue. So it's not a huge problem, but it's just one of those things that's a little annoying in Max, in my opinion. In Blueprint, uh, there's support for arrays, tables, dictionaries, all kinds of stuff. 
you can um, also author arbitrarily new structures from scratch using like a markup. So this is a little animated GIF on the left here where uh, I'm sort of defining a dummy sort of structs. It's exactly like a C struct where you create on the left the name of your variables and the types and you need to add tool tips and stuff like that. And over here, you can instantiate a variable on the left here you see of that new structure type and you can sort of grab it and get its data and make arrays of it and that kind of a thing. So it's a it's it's much more like C++ thinking um, that you can do in, in uh, Blueprint without even opening up C++. That's sort of the idea here. So then uh, the next big topic is sort of like your workflow. How do you how you organize scripts um, and how that works? A uh, big thing in Max is this idea of abstractions, where you can write a script and then you know save it off as a Max Pat and then load that up as a as an abstraction. You can also take a complex a node that you have, and then sort of collapse it down into a sub sub patch. That's what I just am demoing here in the in the GIF. Uh, it's very useful if you have a really complicated thing with lots of different uh, nodes to be able to sort of collapse things down and and organize all your stuff. Blueprint has similar sort of behavior. Uh, you of course can you know blueprints themselves are instantiable, so your whole blueprint can be done once and then used in many different places, which I would call analogous to an abstraction. Or uh, within a blueprint itself, if you have really complicated logic, you can also collapse your graph. This is analogous to a uh, sub patch. So you can see right here, I'm taking a really complicated thing and then I collapse it down and you can see that it's like represented as a separate node. And you hover, this is a really nice feature. You hover over it and kind of gives you a sort of thumbnail view of the graph. Um, you can see right there when I hover over it. Um, you also have the ability to make macros and functions and all other kinds of things to help you organize your graph. So a big feature uh, in any of these kinds of things is debugging, trying to like unwrap your sp literal spaghetti code. Um, so in Max, uh, there's this is not getting into extreme details here, but it has a full debugging suite. I remember when this was added for Max 5, it was like mind blowing. Um, but you can add breakpoints, you can like slowly step through your graph and see exactly what's happening. You can add watch variables. Um, there's a whole window that lets you monitor your script and all that kind of stuff. It's great. It's awesome. Um, also, uh, also great is Blueprint has similar sort of uh, structure for debugging. You can add arbitrary breakpoints to any node. It halts the execution of your game and lets you step through. You can add watch variables. A little, like I didn't demo it, but you can add a little thing that pops up a window that says like what the value is on any kind of connection um, and things like that. So it's very analogous to Max in that regard. So another big thing is I, I would call it script messaging. Um, basically, you you don't want to necessarily have to have a connection between every single thing in the graph um, and have like connections everywhere. Or you maybe you want to have, you know, basically you want to have the ability to broadcast the message and receive it multiple places. Max has support through send and receive uh, or send tilde and receive tilde for for audio DSP. Um, but basically. Uh, this is a very useful thing that anybody who's done max patching uh, will use quite a bit. In Blueprint, you have a similar sort of concept. Um, not only can you, you know, just call functions arbitrarily on Blueprints, which I would say kind of in, in a way can be a similar sort of behavior, but you also have the ability to do uh, make your own events. So you saw over here the event begin play. There's some built-in events that just exist. There's a sort of API of built-in events, begin play, on tick, these kinds of things that you can use. You can also make your own arbitrary events. And I would call this sort of analogous to send and receive. And so here I made my own custom event that I called my custom event foo. And using the execution pin, I can call that event. The cool thing about um, events in Blueprint is that you can have arbitrary data passed over, you know, just like you know, you can see these color-coded pins here. This is a some object. Um, this is a boolean. This is a float, and this is something like string or something. I don't remember what it is, but um, um, so this is like broadcasting, and this is receiving that event. And any just like send and receive, you can have one sender and many receivers. You can have the same thing with events. And you can, there's a whole other system called an event dispatcher, which sort of lets you control precisely how events get broadcast, who events, who broadcasts it. And there's more complicated stuff uh, related to this, but the general gist is that this is a script messaging system. The next big topic I think is important to uh, mention is C++ nativization. Basically taking your, this is basically taking your script, which is executing in some virtual machine or some runtime, 
and then compiling it down to native code, C++, um, in some automatic way. Um, Max has uh, recently added uh, gen support, which is really awesome. But basically, uh, inside the Max graph, you can uh, use special objects which are uh, tuned to automatically allow you to convert things to C++. Uh, there's a doc, doc on this and how that, all that works. Also, uh, there's for PD, there's Heavy, which is sort of going in this direction. It's a third-party library, um, and it converts PD-like patches to C++ code. It's not uh, from, I was talking with a Heavy guy. They might even be in the audience here. Um, it's not a straight-up PD thing. They've sort of made a PD shell that looks like PD. But the basic idea of that is nativization of a, of a node graph, which is a really cool concept. So in Blueprint, we have native nativization support. Um, basically, you can turn your entire Blueprint script into native code. There's some caveats and some stuff that dealt, deals with that. And so I sort of posted this. Basically, just Google UE4 Blueprint nativization, and you'll see all of the different stuff. But the TLDR is that it does it is supported. It's a new feature in, in, a, in UE4. Um, but basically, it's in a you know project settings. You can go down, define packaging, and then turn on Blueprint nativization. So uh, the next big topic is uh, how do you extend the graphing environment? This is like third-party stuff if you want to make your own objects. I already mentioned you know, a, a lot of the deficiencies of Max, like uh, storing data and things like that, have been extended through third-party libraries. Um, and so that's what this topic is about. For Max, they have a C API. Um, and I've uh, one of my good friends actually wrote a C++ extension of their C API, so you can actually do uh, – this is uh, Graham Wakefield. He actually, I think, still works for Cycling74. Anyways, uh, so the point is that there is an API that you can use to extend uh, objects in the environment. And it's a little bit, I would call it sort of advanced. Uh, you kind of have to know what you're doing in C and C++, but it totally uh, works. It's awesome. Um, but it is a little bit sort of difficult. I, I would call it relatively difficult to extend Max uh, and uh, similar with PD. In Blueprint, um, as I said in the very beginning, Blueprint from the very beginning it was built to make it easy to extend to C++. Um, so this is an example of a, a ring modulation a setting structure that I have a, as a source effect that I added for uh, 416 for the new audio engine. Um, uh, but basic, by the way, this is the only thing that is dependent, this particular slide that you know, everything else that I've been saying has nothing to do with the, the new audio engine backend. Um, this is just sort of general blueprint st stuff. But basically, if you notice here that there's special sort of markup that defines things. Oh, this is, you know, a blueprint type. You know, this is just something that you have to do for a bunch of code generated functions that do uh, reflection, automatic C++ to blueprint reflection. Um, and uh, basically, you mark up your properties, your min and max. This is for like the uh, the editor interface and things like that. This shows this lets you show up where where it shows up in categories in the editor, um, and you know you set up your defa default types. Anyways, the point is is that it's this will just be sufficient to just having it automatically show up and usable in Blueprint. Um, so in other words, uh, it's it's a uh, fundamentally built to be easily extendable. Um, another important thing too is that um, when you're uh, extending C++ code into your project, if you do that C++ code outside of the engine module um, uh, or the the sort of like thing that you download off the internet, and you just do your C++ code in your project, you can hot load your C++ bindings in the editor on the fly. So um, you could be doing a lot of C++ code and then literally compile it in Visual Studio, and then in the editor, it'll just automatically uh, reload the new DLL, your project DLL, on the fly. So it makes it turns out like writing DSP is way more awesome uh, in this context than even like you know doing something with the if you're editing with a VST because you could be writing your uh, VST effect in C++, recompile it, but then you have to go to the thing and manually reload it and do all this kind of stuff, you know. Just having it automatically load, I found to be a very great uh, benefit for uh, iterating on C++ DSP. Okay, so this is a nice segue to synthesis and DSP in Blueprint. Um, so obviously in Max and PD, there's the whole thing is built on on having DSP support in a graph situation. So back in the day, Max originally only supported event graph stuff. Um, that's analogous basically to Blueprint. Um, 
And then they added support for DSP graph within the same graph, and that was the MSP part of Max MSP for a long time. And they rebranded Max for, I think, Max 5. They stopped calling it Max MSP because they're like, okay, it's it's cool. We have a DSP graph. We don't need to keep talking about it. Uh, MSP stood for Max Signal Processing uh, or Miller S Pucket, depending on who you uh, talk to. Um, but anyways, it's it's uh, built in. And Blueprint, as I just said, there's no DSP node support. It's all just on the game thread. However, uh, Synthesis, this is the new stuff for 4.16 um, with the new audio engine. I have a, 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 like streamlined writing new Synthesis by creating a Synthesis component. Um, and it's really easy to, to instantiate a new Synthesis component. I just took a screenshot here. Basically, in the editor, you can say, like, you know, they have a little wizard. You say new C++ class. You say what... Um, what uh, ba uh, base class you want to inherit from. And in this case, I, I inherited from synth component. And then it you know knows to do this stuff. You name your class, and then you just say, done. They did this. I was testing Android. I just realized this is like an Android test project, but whatever. Uh, so anyways, that, that's sort of how the wizard. And then with this, I, I wrote sort of a template code generation so that with the wizard, it'll just give you this. So this is basically the code that would show up and you can kind of see this is like a all the code that exists to do like a sine wave sort of hello world thing um and you can of course insert your own dsp this is this would be where you if if you're writing your own or you've already written something really cool maybe you've added a a really cool object in max uh that does some awesome granular synthesizer hopefully you've done it in such a way that your code is independent of max so that you can easily port it to some other system um all you'd have to do is, this is oh, on the left here, if you can see my mouse here, is on generate audio. This is just a float buffer of audio that's output. Um, and it's initialized, it tells you the sample rate. And uh, you specify how many channels of audio that you're going to generate. Right now it supports one or two channels per synth component. Um, basically, you just output the number, your audio right here. You just, just feed out the audio. And this is called on the DSP graph. And then here is the sort of uh, threading situation that I was telling you about. Uh, so over here is a U function. This is markup to expose into Blueprint a function um, that you want to you know, be able to call from Blueprint. Um, and you just say set frequency. Um, so you say frequency hertz, whatever. This is the default 440 hertz. And this would show up as a node automatically in Blueprint. This is literally all the code you need to do to have all of the Blueprint support uh, for everything. Um, and you would automatically have a function that you could call on your new synth component. And over here, I created a sort of helper function that basically allows you to create a macro, or not a macro, a lambda, um, so that it, this is, keep in mind, this is called on the game thread. And you basically just do the things that you want to do on the audio thread right here, and it queues it up and automatically executes it at the right time and in the right order on the audio render thread. So you don't really have to worry about it. Like you don't have to do any extra special code. This is literally all that you'd need to do to, to get your oscillator stuff. So this is just my oscillator class. You see over here, it says DSP uh, OS, OS H. It's not open sound control, it's oscillator H. And uh, it's just a simple oscillator thing that I use in the synthesizer that Dan uses later in his presentation. But anyways, this is sort of just gives you an idea of how easy it should be to be able to write your own synthesizers. It's a similar uh, workflow for effects, uh, for DSP effects as well. And that's it. That's my presentation. How? What time is it? I wasn't even looking at the time. Did I just talk for two hours? No. That's about half an hour. All right. <laughs> it was kind of a shotgun blast of information, but like I said, it was hopefully just to give you get, get you an idea if you're not familiar with Blueprint. And if you are familiar with Blueprint, maybe it's a little bit more solid. Uh, than it was before. So at this point, um, we were going to open it up for any questions related to this presentation, if you just have general questions about Blueprint or, or anything like that. Cool. If you have a question, would you mind coming up to the front? To hey, Aaron, can you hear me OK? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, just to let you know, the template code is very small. So even with my glasses on, I couldn't really see it on the screen. Sure. Uh, so I have two questions, if that's OK. Yep. Uh, first one is, um, since you're updating your parameters from the game thread and then queuing them up into the audio thread, are you dealing yep. with interpolation? So you would have to you would have to do that yourself. My oscillator deals with the interpolation. Right. So when you call set frequency and update, it's dealing with that internally. Sure. Uh, the other question was a general question about blueprints because 
Uh, when I last evaluated this, which admittedly was about a year ago, uh, all of the bindings between objects had to be at compile time and not at runtime. And one <coughs> of the scenarios I envisaged was uh, uh, observer pattern when you don't know how many receivers you're going to have. So mm -hmm. uh, when I talked to, I actually ended up talking to a guy from Splash Damage about this, and he said the same thing that I suggested, which was to make a broadcastable object with mm -hmm. broadcastable receivers and then do it on the C++ side. Yep. Has that changed at all? Have you got a thing for that that's out of the box, or do we still have to roll uh, it around? So I'll caveat this. This is like me cheerleading Blueprint, but I'm not, like Blueprint is deep. Um, so I'm not an expert on all facets of Blueprint. I've actually never personally shipped a game or tried to ship a game in Blueprint. Um, so uh, I I don't think I can sufficiently answer that question, like to probably in a way that's satisfactory to you. Uh, however, I will say that um, it is common to do things into C++ uh, to compensate for potential deficiencies in blueprint which i would say is a positive aspect of blueprint in the sense that like i mean it is a pretty complicated language it's trying to do tons of things and it's actively being developed and so the question the answer to your question is maybe i haven't personally dealt with this idea of of you know ha having issues with dynamic binding um I like uh, and it, it could have been idea. fixed by now i mean it, like yeah. it's changing constantly you get the last release notes the list of things in blueprint changes are s significant uh, maybe they don't want you to make them broadcastable. That's my conclusion, because it makes it very I, complicated and obfuscates what you're doing. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of stuff, too. They try really, it's, Blueprint is a rope, uh, you know, in terms of having a rope to hang yourself, I think Blue, Blueprint is a rope generating machine. Yeah. Uh, so I think, like, it just feeds tons and tons of rope to users. Yeah. And there's certain areas that I think they try really hard to kind of prevent you from hurting yourself too much. Um, and that could be uh, something like that. One of the things that they have, uh, like in, we, we use Blueprint, of course, in all our internal games, uh, like Paragon uh, is this big multiplayer game. If you don't know about it, it's like a it's like a MOBA multi mass or multiplayer online battle arena. You have all these different characters and different skill sets, and they have they've written like a kind of custom event system to manage all of those kinds of things. And I remember at one point it was a rat's nest of insanity um, in terms of like dealing with. You know, you could imagine like with the event broadcasting system that I was talking about Constantly going crazy broadcast. with that. Um, so, yeah. Sorry if I, it's probably an unsatisfying answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, specifically, maybe things that you can do in Max or PD that you're used to, if it's possible to do in Blueprint and things like that. What about um, Aaron as well? Uh, what about control? What about um, if you want to interact with your patch, whether it's through MIDI or OSC or whatever? So um, Dan will demo uh, sort of, he's got it hooked up with the, his MIDI keyboard right here, and he'll show you how that all that works. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, um, did not mention, I probably could have had a slide. There's way more to this than even what I could shotgun through. There's a whole UI system that's called uh, Unreal Motion Graphics, UMG, and it's built on a uh, UI system called Slate, which the entire UE4 editor is built on. It's a C++ graphics or uh, UI API. And it's actually really easy to create your own custom sort of uh, interfaces. I wouldn't say it's as easy as Max in terms of like creating sliders and, you know, Max has like presentation mode and scripting mode and all that kind of stuff. That makes like inter like building really cool interactive uh, interfaces very easy in Max, but it's not that much more difficult in Blueprint. There's a whole uh, WYSIWYG editor. You can drag sliders. You can, you know, basically it's all in Blueprint. So once you create your WYSIWYG view, it's just a matter of like hooking up what the slider does and how it broadcasts information to your patch. So if you want real-time interactivity with your blueprint for procedural music purposes, uh, it's very easy to hook up sliders and buttons and things like that. You can hook it up to key bindings so that like if you imagine you're working on a game and you want to create a system so that it lets you play the game but then tweak procedural music parameters while the game's running, um, you could hook up, for example, you know, a special console command or a or a special key that pops up your procedural music UI that's just for like, you know, development purposes. 
that, that then you could tune and then push a button to save and serialize out your settings. Um, all that stuff you can hook up in Blueprint. It's um, it's not that bad, but it's not as easy as Max. But it's a uh, you know similar kind of concept. And iterating is generally pretty quickly because, like I said, compiling a Blueprint script is pretty fast. Um, but it's not the same as like live coding. You're not going to do uh, a live code, you know, uh, like on stage writing a Blueprint script. It's really not the use case for that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thanks. Hey, Aaron, um, how easy is it to package up blueprint blueprint scripts for other people to use? Uh, how easy is it possible to pack? Uh, how how difficult or easy it is to package up a blueprint script for other people to use? It's pretty easy, right? So basically, similar to Max, actually, when you copy into your um, your copy buffer, like you can copy and paste between scripts. That actually is in similar to Max, actually just a text. Yeah. So blueprints are just text files, just like Max. So the answer is very easy to transfer blueprints around. But what makes it difficult is when those blueprints depend on things right. inside your project that another guy's project doesn't depend on. So um and because it's so easy to extend <laughs> C code into blueprint, that turns out to be a very common situation, but that's also totally analogous to the situation in Max, where if you're using a bunch of third-party Max objects and you copy and paste your, you know, Max graph and you give it to somebody else, they'll it's not going to work for them because they don't have those those objects downloaded or whatever. It's the same same situation with Blueprint. So I would say it's on the one hand very easy, but you know, just like Max, it's not always easy. So I find that it's really easy to. Uh, yeah, can you hear Dan? Dan saying shit. Yeah. So one of the things that's really easy is uh, in your project to create your own objects and uh, your own variable types. And so oftentimes you will be creating those just because it's part of your your scripting process. And so those won't port as easily to other people's projects. But there is a cool thing in uh, Unreal is you can migrate from a, from a project. So you can select. Um, something in your project, in your content browser, and then you can migrate it to another Unreal, 4, uh, Unreal Engine 4 project, and it will automatically uh, determine references. Oh, right. And so uh, any sort of dependencies, and it'll give you a big list of all the things that are dependent upon. Do you want to move everything over? So Yeah. So in other words, manually doing it is tricky. But if you use, there's a tool that UE4 has that makes migrating between projects easier. Uh, Dan actually did that recently. He built this massive QA test suite that he migrated from a given project to another project, um, and it and it went pretty smoothly. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Oh, one of the things that always comes up, and I'm surprised no one's asking uh, because it's always on the forums and stuff, is uh, timing. Like, you know, people want sample accurate timing and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the issues in the old audio engine um, on PC, especially, but I think it also exists on other platforms, is uh, uh, the timing didn't appear to be very accurate because the way the lower level audio engine was written, um, it was consuming events as fast as possible rather than rather than queuing them up and executing it at the same time. And so it made it feel like the blueprint itself was at fault for timing issues, like, oh, blueprint is terrible at timing. Um, but uh, when I wrote the new audio engine, which is you know uh, for 4.16 and does, has all the synthesis stuff, um, I just simply structured the audio engine so that any events which are broadcast in the same game frame um, are guaranteed to happen at the same point in time, sample accurately on the uh, audio uh, render thread. I wouldn't call it sample accurate from the point of view of like being able to schedule any arbitrary audio event at any point in time. I would say like the only audio scripting language I've seen to be sample accurate in that uh, uh, regard is um, is uh, Chuck. Chuck has got a magical. They call it strongly timed. Chuck is amazing for that in that regard. Um, and I have some ideas for Blueprint. I, w I'm, I think I want to create a, a new type of audio component called maybe something like music component or something like that, whose entire purpose is to do some kind of strongly typed scheduling. So you can schedule 
audio events to happen down to the sample, but it would obviously have a little bit of lag and be just unrolled on the audio render thread. Uh, but that doesn't exist now, of course. But I find that for n the vast majority of procedural music applications that I've tried, like really fast procedural drumming or anything like that, um, the game thread rate is sufficient um, there, and it's steady enough not to hear a lot of drift. Um, and so in those applications, I think the, the current system is sufficient. Where you get issues is if you're trying to do a really complicated uh, music stitching system, which you can do in Blueprint. You could create the most elaborate, awesome uh, interactive music system uh, of your dreams, you know, with crossfading things and blending and blend modes and all that stuff. One of the problems is, is that if you have a very long loop that you're trying to wait, like, say, 15, 20 seconds or something like that, you'll find that, you know, that time, like, if you're, like, at the very end of this long music loop, I want to trigger this and have it be perfect all the time. All of those sort of slight jitters on the game thread will accumulate over time, and you'll find that the timing isn't exactly kosher to the audio render thread, and you'll get little tiny offsets off of that, which I find to be the the number one issue in timing in that regard. Um, and something like a music scheduler would solve that problem. That's why I just asked a question and answered it myself. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, I, I guess if there's no more questions, um, Dan uh, has a really cool demo. So uh, we we were having issues getting it to sound good through Skype. So we sent the uh, like YouTube video uh, so that you guys could hear it first in like full full quality HD mode. Uh, it's really not a stunning visual thing, but uh, the thing to because we actually thought it kind of badass not to worry about the visuals because uh, for our GDC talk, if you saw our GDC talk, there's a huge amount of you know, pressure from ex epic executives and stuff to like make sure that it looks good because UE4 is all about looking cool. But this is to you guys, this audio audience. So we purposely just literally have a black screen with sliders. Um, um, but <laughs> so it's just music. Um, and uh, basically, you'll see the sliders are done with UMG and all of the music is done through blueprint logic. And uh, a sam the drums are done through samples. Um, Dan actually sampled the synthesizer for the drum samples. Um, he created like drum samples with the the subtractive synthesizer. Um, and then he has, how many uh, how many synths are running simultaneously? You have a chord one without melody. without the uh, without the drums yeah. without the drums uh, about five 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 like simultaneous synthesizers. Um, with the, the reason why he had to kill the drums, he was doing it is that. Uh, the, my subtractive synthesizer wasn't designed for drums, um, but Dan is a synth wizard and came out with a way to make them sound awesome as like a like a little synth drum kit. But the way to do that is he's creating like two or three instances of a synthesizer for like a drum bass and for different layers and stuff like that. So it gets a little bit perfy uh, when you start running like ten synthesizers at once. Uh, so we kind of we took this what he was doing in terms of the samples and then just plays it in samples and then has a couple of layers of uh, subtractive synthesizers playing at the same time. All right, so I'll let the organizers there play the video.
All right, cool. Um, so I, uh, so I'm, I'm, my presentation is gonna be a lot less structured. I'm gonna go through, uh, mostly in, I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about premise, what, what we thought might be a good premise, just, you know, because composing music, it's very sort of um, idea generated, right? <clears throat> so, uh, you know, there, there, are, because because of the robustness of the language, there's just so many different ways you could create uh, music um, with with blueprints. So, this is just one way, and I, I don't want to um, uh, have you guys think of this as like a prescription to uh, for your music, like. I want you guys to explore it, try cool things. Um, but I'd like to show you, you know, uh, how I did that. So Aaron thought it'd be good to start out with uh, showing you the the uh, UMG widget, since he just talked about that and he likes he likes uh, segways. So um, <clears throat> oh, nice. All right. Uh, so with the with blueprints, yeah, pretty easy to work with uh, here. If you right click in the content browser, um, you've got all these uh, objects and assets that you can create uh, from a context menu. And um, as Aaron demonstrated in his thing, you can create brand new classes either. Uh, new C++ based classes or uh, classes uh, based off of uh, blueprints itself. So um, if we go down to the user interface, there's a widget. And the widget is basically the main, uh, the main guy for creating your own, your own user interface. Um, so here's the WYSIWYG editor and uh, basically, pretty easy to use. Drag and drop. You can create your own objects if you if you want to get into Slate. Um, but you know most of the essentials are going to be here: sliders, buttons, things like that. Uh, input, uh, and then all of these can be skinned and styled in any way you want. And then um, <clears throat> your your objects. They have different kinds of objects. They have like objects that are, are for layout, um, and then there's objects that you can interact with. And so uh, here's all the sort of styles and visual, you know, parameters you can adjust. Um, but at the bottom, you can see events that are automatically associated with that. And once you click on one of these, uh, like here, I've used for this slider, the tempo slider. I've used on value changed. So if the the value changes, um, then it it begins a, a blueprint event, and then that that executes uh, some some things, which is really simple here. And um, <clears throat> in this case, we're broadcasting events. So uh, Aaron talked about event broadcasting. Event broadcasting is basically uh, the approach that you'll probably use. Uh, the most to get blueprints to talk to other blueprints. Like you can create things uh, completely in one blueprint, but you might find it uh, more practical, depending on your project or your needs, to have like a bunch of different blueprints um, and sort of they are dynamically created or instantiated, uh, and then you have other blueprints talking to other blueprints. So there's a couple of different ways that you might do that. Um, but in this case, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the my approach here and why I did what I did. So um, the way that I decided to do this particular project is uh, I created a, a blueprint actor that would sort of manage all of my timing, kind of like a conductor. And then I created separate actors for each of the instrument types. And I did this because originally we flirted with the idea of having maybe the instruments in like a space and that you might navigate that space and then 
because they're actors, an actor type, uh, that that particular type of object has uh, cool things like spatialization built in. And so um, we we thought maybe maybe we might uh, have you know the the user explore the space and you could have the instruments spatialized in that space. That's but uh, I think we just sort of acknowledged that we weren't you know what, badass artists and <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. Like <laughs> it didn't look that good. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, and then, of course, you know, trying to figure out interesting ways to interact with the space. I mean, that's it just it becomes like a scope creep. Um, and, you know, it's fun. But uh, but the presentation is today. So <laughs> uh, so that's that's sort of the method I chose. Um, you know, you could have everything in one actor if you wanted to. Um, but I, I decided to uh, have have. It's sort of that way where where there's like a conductor object and that sort of that object transmits um, like timing information, musical timing information and structural information like which bar are we in, which beat are we in, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I I also like the idea of having instruments um, be independent actors because um, they uh, <clears throat> They, uh, I like the idea of an instrument deciding its own behavior. I just think that's cool. Like, like the instrument's going to decide, well, you know, you give me this timing information. I decide what I want to do with that. Um, and I think that's neat for like, you know, prototyping ideas and then seeing if it works. And then if it doesn't, you didn't spend too much long, you know, spend too much time on it. You can take it out, put some new one and create a new one. Um, so so yeah, that's kind of the approach I took. So what you see here is just like a, a blank level with uh, a bunch of actors in it that I just sort of threw into the level. Their placement actually doesn't mean anything uh, at the moment. Um, but the way that uh, UE4 sort of expects you to work is to, to have a level. So you start with a level, and that's kind of like your base script. Everything runs from a level. Um, so, and then you can save levels out, right? You can put things into the level and then save it, save that level and have multiple levels and so on, uh, navigate between levels and stuff. You can even stream levels in anyway. <clears throat> so, uh, I didn't need to use the level script, but you can, it has its own, every level has its own blueprint script. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so in this case, I have a conductor object, which I think I named, um, I named it my soundtrack controller. Half of making blueprints is just coming up with names. Um, so in this case, I uh, I have this event, right? My temp my tempo slider. When the values changed, and the value it, on sliders is between zero and one. Um, so what I do is I uh, I map that value across a range that I've determined in advance. Um, certain things that I've made in this case, assumptions that sometimes are made for brevity, sometimes are made for prototyping and just stuck. Um, and then sometimes just for reasonable purposes. Like in this case, I have a tempo range <laughs> and that tempo range is I've predefined. Um, and, uh, it's, I use a 2d vector, which is just two floats. Um, and I decided 60 was going to be my bottom and 120 was going to be my top BPM. And so now this slider has been mapped from when it's at its lowest uh, level, it will be my value A, which in this case is 60. And uh, at high, highest level, value B, which would be 120. Uh, and then um, I set a variable that belongs to this blueprint, uh, which means that other blueprints inside of this uh, script can access that variable. And then uh, I go through a loop of all the soundtrack controllers. In this case, there's only one, but, um, and I'll show you why there's an array, um, just in case there are more than one, because uh, I don't know necessarily know in advance. Uh, and then I say, hey, give me those. And I set their tempo, uh, because they also have a tempo variable. 
Um, so just like any other uh, blueprint, uh, blueprints basically start out with uh, their construction and then their uh, begin play. So like when we hit the play button, what happens? Uh, certain types of blueprints will actually have uh, scripts that, that are part of their construction script that actually operate before the game is played during preview mode. Um, and with the uh, UMG is one of those. Uh, but what I want is when the UMG is actually instantiated in the game, in this case, I get all of my soundtrack controllers and I deposit them into uh, an array of soundtrack controllers. Um, and I do this because I don't know, I don't know how many there might be. The function doesn't know for sure. Uh, I can presume that there's only going to be one, uh, and I do make that assumption. <laughs> but uh, there could be more than one. And um, so then I set a bunch of initialized variables. I uh, grab some variables. I set some local variables, and that's actually how I set the initial values of the uh, UMG. So um, in this case, the, my sliders, tempo, activity level, and darkness level, which I can explain uh, when I talk about the, the aesthetic premise that I had for this. And then what I do is I go and I set these values on the sliders themselves so that, uh, so that then when the UMG is called up, they automatically have the proper values. So these values are basically grabbed from my soundtrack controller. All right, so we'll go to the soundtrack controller because that's where the meat and potato starts. Okay, so this, <laughs> this is my soundtrack controller. <laughs> Uh, but I've commented everything, uh, as much for my own sake as yours. So uh, basically, when I start out, I the soundtrack controller actually creates the UMG widget. I could have done this in the level script. Maybe it would have been more practical to do that. Uh, but Or I could have given uh, a, an, another actor that just instantiates the, uh, the uh, UI, but... Um, you know, that's that's architecture thing, right? At this stage, I can take this soundtrack controller and I can put it in any level and it automatically creates that widget. Um, so I just grab the widget and I, I add it to the player screen and then I show the cursor. I just set some basic uh, visibility parameters. Uh, and then this is, so this is when when we begin play. And then the execution just keeps going in order. And sometimes I'll, you'll notice like here I put a delay. And sometimes I just put a delay on the execution if I know that some like uh, there's sort of a hitch with uh, blueprints, that just sort of a gotcha, is that um, you can't be sure exactly what order all of your actors in a, in a level scene are necessarily going to instantiate in. And so sometimes you want to wait <laughs> until uh, those have all been placed in the scene. It's like a next frame or something. Yeah, exactly. It's like, wait wait a second, and then do like find all of these guys. Because what I want to do, essentially, is I set some initial parameters locally, and then I want to start uh, you know, working with my, my instrument actors. And so I wait first, and then I have a... Uh, a custom event that actually just goes to another part of this script. Um, and this is a really uh, clean way of like, uh, so I have an event here, right? That, that I, a custom event I called start playback. Um, and now I can call it anywhere in, in my script, in my graph. I can just call it from anywhere. It's like the send receive. Thing. Yeah, it's kind of like the send receive. But this this is something that uh, this particular the way to do this is really just inside the same graph. Um, so, and sometimes you'll you'll decide like, oh, do I need this to be a function? Do I need this to be an event? Do you know what are the sort of uh, deterministic 
you know, why, why would you decide one or the other? And uh, in most cases, event stuff is going to be anything that has to has to deal with timing. And uh, you leave things like functions to, um, you know, I, I usually leave functions to like processing, like like math. Or some, something that I do over and over again um, that doesn't have any sort of timing. You can't do delays inside. You can't do delays inside of a function. Um, you can create macros if you find yourself doing a delay over and over again. But I, I don't really like macros. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> we've been sort of – I think par partially because we've been playing around with the synthesizers that Aaron wrote, is, which are really cool. Um, and then – just sort of thinking about synthesizers, real-time synthesizers and games and stuff like that. And so we were we were kind of uh, in, enjoying that sort of pastiche that like uh, Richard Vreeland and uh, that the sort of similar class composers uh, like um, what was that uh, the Hyperlight Drifter and Sword and Sorcery and all those sort of like they, they're like they're referencing. The sort of the old days when you had real time synthesis in games, but at the same time they're kind of applying that sort of vintage feel, but like it with like a higher aesthetic, like a more cinematic or higher aesthetic. It's just kind of cool. Um, so that was kind of like the the seed premise. And uh, one of the things I noticed a lot of uh, them doing was actually using uh, tape. Uh, uh, like tape wow and flutter effects on their master bus to kind of give things like a vintage feel. Um, and so I kind of spoof that and I'll show that's what this wow effect is supposed to do. I don't know if you could hear it in the demonstration, but there's like a, there's like a pitch drift, a unified pitch drift on all of the, all of the uh, playing objects. And so, um, but I tried to keep it subtle, but not too subtle. You know, it's one of those things. Um, so that's that. If you see the wow effect, uh, that's what I was doing there. And then I like to do this uh, in all my blueprints. I have, I usually have some kind of debug information that I will want to print out. Um, and I'll usually put a uh, public variable, a Boolean debug to branch that. So it's like, if I decide I want, you know, it to, this particular object to spit out debug information, uh, I will do that. And in this case, uh, I spit out uh, some text that just says, uh, oh, it gives me the timeline length and the play rate uh, because I do a little thing here. So I have tempo and I have a time signature. And the way that I use my, and I'll show you, uh, the way that I create my music pulse, my execution pulse, I, uh, I want to be able to modify that. Uh, based on uh, changes in time signature or tempo, um, so I, I I start I start out by setting those initializing those values, and then I was like, hey, I just want to make sure this is working, <laughs> so I print out the text. So uh, once the uh, the uh, event begin play has executed through, and execution uh, is just in order of these execution paths, these white execution paths, um, then it will be up to other events to be called in order to do all this other stuff. In my case, however, I actually call other events uh, on this execution path. So I call start playback and I call uh, start wow effect. And this is your uh, coroutine situation, right? So it's executing both of these events. Um, so uh, the playback on playback, uh, I there's there's sort of like some initialization, and then I uh, basically have like this uh, this execution traffic cop that uh, just starts executing certain things, and um, I wasn't sure how elaborate the music was going to get. I think I ended up not being as elaborate as I planned for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So there's stuff that I didn't end up using as much, um, but in this case, when I call uh, start playback, I uh, initiate a sequence. The first one being to initiate the background tick, um, and sequences are initiated in order. And so in this case, I uh, I have I use an interface, a blueprint interface. It's the same thing as a programming interface, 
It just has a list of virtual functions, and I can apply it to uh, all of my instrument objects. And that's what I did. So I have uh, a bunch of virtual functions that all of my instrument objects have, and then each object, each instrument decides what to do with that information, right? Um, and so in this case, I wasn't sure how many background uh, objects I was going to have. So I have, I think I've got one, <laughs> but it's it's just doing though sort of, there's like a, a wind noise uh, loop. Uh, actually, you know, that's two synths. I didn't think about that. That could have been an optimization. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that was something that I heard a lot on those kinds of soundtracks was they, they like to use uh, synth noise like white noise or, or pink noise as sort of like a background to kind of fill in the space. And there was also something uh, else about – there's something about noise in general. Uh, I remember uh, I was talking to um, uh, the uh, – Bear McCreary's uh, synth programmer, and he was mentioning how he learned um, just adding a little bit of noise to your synth just makes it feel so much more natural. Um, and I think there's just that is. Say that again. Oh, now I'm hearing myself. Hello? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I heard. Am I still going? I'm still good? Okay, I saw some hands move in the dark. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Uh, anyways, I think there's just something about noise in general uh, added to a synth bed that just makes it feel uh, much more natural. I think it's just the randomness of noise, um, So, especially filtered noise. So, um, so yeah, I have a, a background object, and this ambience object is like super simple. We'll jump over to it. Um, I'll show you the interface. The interface is also very basic. Uh, it's all just it's just a list of functions, and each function has an input and an output. And most of the time, I just have an output that says, "Hey, was it was this executed successfully?" Um, so I, I keep it simple as much as I can. And then my uh, my ambient background object here. All right, this one wasn't cleaned up. All right, so on its begin play, all it does is uh, add um, some presets to the synth. One of the cool things that Aaron did when he created his synth was to create a preset structure. The preset structure is uh, pretty big because it's a fully modular synth and you can see all of the variables that uh that you could set <laughs> in this synthesizer uh so it's it's more practical to store those <laughs> and um and so in this case i've actually just created uh presets locally uh because they're just they're just data structures uh they, with a bunch of variables in them, uh, I can set those here. It's just a much easier interface for me to, to sort of manage that. Um, and then and then on execution, I just say, hey, you know, this is your preset. Uh, this is your preset. And so in this case, I have two synthesizers um, that run concurrently. And here you, I, I have an event. Start ambient background, uh, which which is a node on has a node on event targets both of these synthesizers, uh, and then it runs a sequence. First, it plays the uh, background timeline. So I I use this a lot. I'll talk about timelines. Timelines are a component, a blueprint component, um, and basically they're uh, they're kind of like a uh, a sequence. It's like kind of like a you can create like sequences of curves, float curves, um, vector curves, event curves, uh, and and basically transmit information. I use timelines a lot. They're really handy if you're doing anything sort of it's with like music or animation. DAW uh, automation. Yeah, so I I'm using it like a DAW automation, and in this case, um, I have this background control, and what it is doing is is essentially controlling the gain 
of one of my synthesizers. And in fact, I have um, two of them. And they're controlling the gain of my uh, my noise synthesizers uh, separately. So like they're running at different um, rates. So I have uh, that's what, the same timeline, by the way, right? Yeah, this is so. This is uh, these are two different timelines oh, that are executed that in. The same. So first, I have this this timeline, and then this timeline, and one timeline goes to is con basically con automating one synth, and another timeline is automating another synth, and that's why I have two sort of noise synthesizers in the background, kind of going. <laughs> And uh, they're going at different rates. Um, so you'll see here that uh, I, I kind of want it to feel natural. So the the rate the rate is randomized on each one. So every time uh, you'll see this here. Every time I finish a cycle, every time it goes through one cycle, it executes this, and I set the play rate for this guy to be random between uh, uh, a factor of. 0.75 or 1.5, so either 50% uh, faster or or, uh, or a little slower. And then this uh, other one, similarly, except that its range is much greater. So uh, I have these two independent uh, noise synthesizers just just making noise. And actually, it was really fun to listen to on its own. Yeah, <laughs> it was like once I had that, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go to sleep to it. Though. Yeah, yeah. It was. It, it, you could make like a background sleeping app or something like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah. And then if I go back to my uh, soundtrack controller, you can see I'm using it. Once I've executed the background, I'm actually using a timeline. But in this case, a timeline of events. So let's see if you can see this. What I did, and this is sort of. And this probably could have been implemented more thoughtfully, um, but basically what I have is, uh, it, if you remember at the beginning, I set this timeline length based on the time signature. And so what I've done here is I said, here at the beginning, I I have a execution of a of a bar event at the beginning, and then at the beat, I have an execution of beats. And each beat is set up one second apart. And then I have 12 of them, or sorry, yeah, 12 of them. And then I, uh, if I have uh, like a four, four, then I set the length to be just under four seconds. And if I have five, four timing, then it would just be just under five seconds. So that the, the uh, cycle here would basically execute a bar at the beginning and a beat at the beginning and then hit a beat every second. But then based on the tempo, if I go back to my event graph, you can see where I set that up in the beginning. So here's the uh, here's my time signature. And time signature is a custom structure I made. Um, and I can show you how to, how to do that. It's really super easy. Um, basically, I, cr I created a time signature structure which just has an integer of beats and then a note, and the note is a custom. What? Sorry, I wasn't sure if you were like. A note was is basically a custom enumerator that I created as well. A note duration, right? Um, so in this case, uh, I probably just set some boring four four or something like that. But so it'll spit out four in four for the beat integer, and then just a little bit less, and then then sets the length of the timeline, and then gets the duration. And then I have a custom function that I created called get music duration. And this is very simple. It just says, hey, my duration, and my duration is an enumerator where the uh, whole note is zero, and then ha half note is one, and then quarter note is two, and eighth note is three. And because I set up that enumeration like that, I can actually use a, a two to the power of and um, basically uh, multiply it with my tempo data and spit out a time for how long in seconds is that particular duration. Um, 
and this is in a uh, this is in a library, so you can create your own function libraries uh, if you use them over and over and over again. And so this is a blueprint function library that I created for this project. So <clears throat> get mu music duration time, and then uh, I turn that into a play rate, right? One over my duration, and then that's my new play rate factor. And so then it, it will always play back at the tempo that I want it. Uh, so then I have this really complex looking graph, which is basically just uh, execution. So uh, my update, I have, uh, again, I'm using my interface. I get all of my, uh, act, my instrument actors, and then I just send them information on every update, which is every tick, every game frame. Uh, I send them information that is likely to change from frame to frame, like the tempo or the activity level or the darkness level. Oh, yeah, so the darkness level, <laughs> I'll get to those. The, the aesthetic we were going for was that sort of chip tune. And I thought one thing that is kind of fun is like a bit reduction as like a distortion. And so uh, I tried to come up with some excuse for <laughs> – for that effect, and I thought, oh, that'd be cool if, like, it was like a game where uh, the character wanders around, and then there's like darkness gets attached to them or something, and then the music changes because of that. So, uh, but that was like the premise there. Anyway, so I have an update tick that happens every frame, uh, and you gotta be careful with that. You don't want to, you know, use the the tick too much. Um, my recommendation is to use it as little as possible, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, and then I have a bunch of uh, executions where I say update, send an update on the bar, set it up, set an update on every phrase, which I de just determined arbitrarily would be four four bars, and a period would be f uh, two phrases or uh, or uh, uh, eight bars and a double period. And then I ended up not having that much structure to my music anyway. But there you go, I created I created the traffic uh, for it, um, and. Uh, Basically, I loop through all the actors and I send those update functions and they update different things like every bar. Maybe the time signature changes. I don't know. Um, and then every phrase. Uh, oh, I just decided, hey, this is phrase A or not phrase A. Right. Um, and then uh, every update period, I decided oh, um, every period they might update the uh, sequence of chords. So I have a harmonic sequence um, and. So I send that along, and then um, I think I decided, oh yeah, every pe double period we might change the uh, the key and mode. I don't know. Well, we didn't, but maybe. Um, so uh, <clears throat> so this looks really complicated, and it's it's not as complicated as it as it looks. It just became complicated looking, um, but essentially what happens is it just goes through and updates all these things, and I just have some. Uh, uh, I have like a gate system because I don't want to update the bar. I want to update the bar every bar, but I don't want to update the uh, phrase every bar, right? So essentially um, what happens is uh, is basically you'll have like, let's see, um, these execution gates up here. I use something called a multi-gate. A multi-gate is like a execution sequencer. So whereas sequence actually executes everything in one frame, the multi-gate will execute uh, each of these pins uh, every execution. So one each. And so it's a really easy way to create like a cheap counter. If you're like, I know I want to execute this every four times – once every four times, then uh, I create a multi-gate, and it'll just execute it once every four times. I could also create a branch and like count an integer or something like that, but this was just a this was just really easy to slap together. And um, the only problem is, of course, that this can't be changed during runtime, whereas an integer could be. Like I could say, you know, every four, if I wanted to change, for example, how often a phrase occurred. Instead of every four bars, which is how I set it up here, I could have had this uh, with a branch and a variable, and then been able to change the variable, you know, four bars or three bars or whatever. I would have done it with a modulus operator. Yeah, you get exactly a modulus op operator would be good too. Um, 
there's just so many different ways you can do the, like the same thing, and that's kind of fun about Blueprint. I don't know about you guys, but that's fun to, to me in Blueprints. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how I did this uh, this gate system. And this looks more complicated than I um, than probably it should be. Uh, but basically, uh, these are just managing the gates. I use a gate node, and it op opens and closes the gate based on uh, an execution of into the open pin or close pin. Um, basically, I only want to open these sometimes, uh, but I want to make sure that they close after my loop. So I don't want to close them before my loop's over, but I do want to close them after my loop's over. Uh, because I don't know how many uh, instruments are in my scene. I could have like a bunch of them. And so I don't know how often this loop is going to run through. Um, so that's the main tick. And then the last thing I do is I, uh, I update the uh, beat phase um, when the uh, when the bar is done. So every bar, my beat phase is updated to zero and then starts over um, so that it's sending, uh, you know, which beat information out to it's transmitting that properly. The other thing that I started was my little wow effect right here. And that's also in the same graph. And basically, I have a start wow effect and stop wow effect. I didn't actually implement stop wow, but I could have done I I set it up for it. I don't have anything to stop it, but I could have. Um, basically, I have a time like a wacky timeline. Uh, there's like maybe like five minutes of investigating how actual tape Wow and Flutter work, and then I was kind of like, let's do this. So um, <clears throat> basically, I create a scale, uh, a, just a scalar, and uh, based on this, and this timeline plays back. It's 20 seconds long initially. Um, but then every time it finishes the cycle, I, I again, I randomize uh, its playback rate uh, so that it just doesn't always do the same thing every time. It's not as predictable. Uh, it will do it in the same order every time, but you won't notice it. So the wow scalar effect, and then that's something that I send along on my update, which you saw here. So I send tempo information. I send my activity level, which which I assume would be like the player moving around the space, and the, or if they're just sitting still. Um, and then my wow scale, and then the darkness level. <clears throat> and you can see that I've also uh, have another scaler called break effect scaler, which is that button. Uh, I don't know if you saw on the video if it was obvious when I was pressing it or not, <laughs> but basically what it does is it it brings the tempo down, it brings the activity level down, uh, and it brings the uh, wow scale down. Um, actually, probably should have done that in verse. That'd be more interesting. But um, but yeah, so it brings everything down uh, and kind of there's some other modulation. I'm modulating a filter, uh, so it kind of has that sort of everything stopped. But really, everything just slowed down. Um, something, again, it would be like nearly impossible and if it was just all actual audio uh samples. yeah well well it's more doable with samples because i do it with samples but um but like if you had uh real-time audio modulating the performance yeah exactly yeah um because the activity level modulates performance <clears throat> okay so how are we doing on time is it crazy time Show, show them uh, one of the instruments. Instruments. Yeah. All right. So that'll, that'll probably be sufficient. Okay. I think I was. I did the. Um, I think I commented up the uh, sequence. When you press the sequence button, play sequence button, it uh, plays a sequence <laughs> of of notes, um, and <clears throat> the. Uh, this is uh, one of the instruments. What's it's interesting is that each of the instruments are kind of different from each other. They're all based on the same uh, concept. So like I started with uh, an instrument that I actually could perform with my MIDI controller. You're looking at your screen. Oh, sorry. Well, you, you don't have to see it. Anyway, I could perform it with my MIDI controller. And on our forums, we have a new audio forum. You guys should totally check it out. 
there are some uh, you know cool guides that I wrote about getting started with all this stuff, uh, including setting up a MIDI manager so you can perform MIDI. Um, but uh, basically, uh, very similarly, I load my preset. Uh, I uh, in this case, I'm loading it from a preset bank. We have uh, Aaron was cool enough to create a uh, an asset type that is just an array of presets. Um, so I could store them and access them, uh, and that's made iterating the the synth uh, presets a lot easier and much more interesting. And then I just have some debug again. If I uh, have that on, it just says, "Hey, you loaded this this preset." So then um, I have my on beat. Now I remember that traffic cop from this the uh, soundtrack collect <laughs> soundtrack controller was sending out every beat it was sending out a pulse and so um, on the beat uh, this stuff will happen but it will only happen if someone has pressed that uh, pl uh, play sequence button so once that play sequences button is pressed there's an event chain that goes from the umg to here and uh, what that does is it says hey open up this do once which is like a, a gate that only allows one uh, impulse through there's one analogous, execution through there's an analogous object in max that they should what's it called uh, i forget uh, <laughs> yeah, i think it's called once or something like that. there's a aaron saying that there's a max object called once that does some, something, something like similar that. i can't remember the name so, or some something like once um <clears throat> and in this case i go through a little beat divider just a timeline that spits out five pulses uh three on one track and two on another track um, and the timeline is modulated so that uh, it will always uh, play in sync. And I actually do that on the update uh, tick. So every tick is bringing in uh, tempo in and activity information, darkness level, and all this sort of stuff. And then it's modulating. Here's my pitch modulation for the uh, wow effect. And then here's, uh, here's my modulation of my timeline and the beat divider timeline. I just have two timelines. And so then it spits out these impulses, these executions. And based on activity level, if the activity level is low, it's less likely to, to uh, process execution from the extra impulse. Um, but if the activity level is high, it's more than likely and, and or almost certain, uh, depending on how high the activity level is. And basically, these impulses go through. I have. Um, a uh, function in here that uh, every bar creates a new, from the harmony that's coming in, it creates chord tones, uh, an array of chord tones. And I just I just do scale degrees so I can keep it as numbers and use it as math. Um, and then, and I can show you that, uh, but basically I convert the uh, scale degrees to MIDI notes here. So I have my array uh, of a, my little uh, chord tone sequence and then I uh, go through that here. I use a modulus. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I have a counter that starts every uh, beat, or sorry, every bar, uh, and it gets reset. And then I have a little function that I created to just basically convert a, uh, a scale degree uh, based on the mode and the root uh, and the, the, the uh, both the key and the the uh, scale root and the octave, and then basically, uh, we, depending on time, eh, we'll probably just gloss over this real quick. I do some math, <laughs> um, and I account for negative scale degrees, which was complicated and interesting. Um, this probably could have been done like more conveniently with a table, but I thought it was fun to do math. So real quick, yeah. Uh, I think there's a bug here. <laughs> Just tell them. So no, when you no, it's not. This it's not get is uh, inclusive. So this is the length of the vector. You need to do length minus one. No, it's no. No, get is get is index number. Right, but it's inclusive. So the, if your ray length is ten, yeah, you give it ten. This will. So this gives you no. This say, won't give me ten. Because this is a modulus. So the the ray oh, yeah, yeah. the ray length is ten. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Right. <laughs> It's good. Yeah. It's good. Because <laughs> uh, you can get um, 
you can get length or uh, last index, which is both both are super useful for different reasons. Um, but yeah, in this case, doing a modulus, I uh, I get so this allows wrapping basically, right? Um, and in this case, I have a I have a, a constant um, array of integers that that represent uh, my diatonic scale offsets, right? Whole note, half note, half note, etc. So, uh, in this case, I just I wrap through this list and I count. I just create like counting. So if my if my scale coming in is if my uh, scale degree is something like four, then it'll say okay, starting from zero, how many uh, how many pitches are there actual between you know, the root and this degree. Um, and then it's, I do sort of something similar, but in reverse, if I want to go negative, and then it spits out an actual MIDI note by adding it to the octaves uh, that I fed it. <clears throat> so, where was I? Oh, here we are. So that's what that does, spits out my melody note, cool. Um, and then I get a duration based on the tempo and I spit that duration in to uh, the note on, which actually plays the synthesizer. Uh, and then I increase my uh, my ARP count sequence so I don't repeat the note and it goes to the next one in the sequence. So the sequence is created. I'm not getting too crazy here. Every bar, I checked the... I, I just made an assumption. I wasn't at first. I wasn't sure if I was going to make this assumption, but I decided to make this assumption, and that was that each bar would have its own chord. Potentially, I could have obviously more chords per bar or whatever, but um, I decided just that that would be the way I did it. And <clears throat> so I have this chord sequence that's part of the larger broadcast that the soundtrack controller sends out. And that's where it's defined. And if I wanted to change it, that's where I would change it. Um, but uh, I uh, generate uh, chord tones based on the root type chord. So I have a, a function that just basically gives me chord tones based on the chord type. And the chord type is um, a uh, enumeration that's just, it's like unison, um, you know, tertian, quintal, chordal, that kind of stuff. Um, and so it, it, this is a super simple function just says, okay, here's where you're starting, and then count up, boop, 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 and we give these chords. So it gives an array, um, and then what I do is I go through a, a loop, and I basically add the chord tones to my sequence, and randomly, I add non-chord tones between them. That's what happens. And I have a function that generates non-chord tones uh, based on, a you know, your classic non-chord tone types. Uh, and I just made rules for why any of these would be selected, you know, escape tone or pagiatura, um, but they could be. And then they all output back into, a, a, you know, one or two um, non-chord tones. And then these are added. And then the next chord tone is, is brought in. There is some uh, randomness to this. Uh, so, you know, uh, maybe like there's some problems that could arise. Like uh, I could get a a non chord tone that anticipates a chord tone that end up ends up not being used. But I I just don't care that much. Um, <laughs> I just yeah I'm like okay, it's it it does like a melody thing. I'm okay with that. And so uh, yeah, and then I do a little a um, uh, little resetting here if uh, my bar count has been reached. Uh, maybe making an assumption about, you know, that I have one bar per chord. So, yeah, um, that's one of the instruments. Uh, you kind of, could, you know, do a lot of different things. But I think at this stage, I've overwhelmed everyone. <laughs> and uh, I, I think this would be a good time for questions. Um, if if we still have time or I don't know what the, it's all England over there. So. Formed, uh, with the different like uh, modes just to... oh yeah sure uh, i don't know how this is going to sound over there we did some tests and it was i don't know i didn't like it but anyway yeah i did i have it set up so that you can these do are public variables so yeah these see this so as i uh 
going back to my soundtrack, you see these eyeballs here, and if they're on, then they've been uh, made public, and um, so they're tweakable. They're they're yeah they're they're serialized and they're ed- editable inside of the level. And what's cool is they're um, they're serialized to that particular instance of that object. So uh, if I have multiples and I do this to all of my instrument actors, um, <clears throat> if I have multiples, then I can uh, I can edit them independent of each other yeah. as they exist in the scene. Um, so. So yeah. This is your controller. So this is my soundtrack controller, and I can do things like set set the initial tempo. I can set the initial time signature. I can set initial activity levels. My debug, right? My debug flag. If I wanted to get debug information, um, my initial darkness level, uh, root. Uh, the so the the key essentially. But I didn't do proper keys. I just said ah oh, diatonic keys only, and then because it was <laughs> easier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, you know, obviously you could do whatever you want. <laughs> um, and I just did modes cause at least that's an interesting part of diatonic, uh, harmony. Uh, and then, oh, the wow magnification, which is just how strong the pitch, uh, control actually occurs. So yeah, just show them switching different modes. Yeah. So if I do like Ionian, I don't know. Oh, let me, I think I... There we go. So you can also maybe explain, like, when you play a note, just to show them that it's interactive. Like that. Yeah. So here, the the play note actually is very similar. It gets a note uh, very similarly to the sequence instrument. Um, and I think the only thing that, uh, yeah. So if I play the sequence. I forget what the chord se- sequence is. I think it's something really basic, like one, four, five, one, <laughs> one, two, five. I think I, you know, do some something like that. Uh, it's not like crazy, uh, but I don't know if you can hear. Um, it's basically in major. To connect the dot to the. Uh, the, the yeah, so this this is this is inside the game. So like I don't know, we weren't sure exactly. You know, it's sort of like an imaginary game in this case. Um, but yeah, I was thinking, you know, uh, you could play a note if you collect like a star, or, I don't know, a coin or something like that. Uh, um, and then a sequence when something happens it could be like you know locating a new zone or something like that, or I don't know. Um, and then the, the uh, darkness idea was. Um, to have something that would like, uh, you know, like maybe the area is, you know, danger or something, or I don't know, maybe there's more enemies around or something like that. And then the activity level will be like the player is moving around. So when they're moving around, you get some like, you know, beat drum beat and stuff like that. Um, but the there are fewer notes performed at you know lower activity levels. Um, same with the bass. Actually, the bass and drums are kind of together. Uh, very similarly uh, uh, created. So, yeah, and I don't know. I just thought it was cool to have a tempo slider. <laughs> I don't know if there would be a, uh, a game need for that, but I thought that was neat. And I actually have, like, um, synth parameters being modulated by a tempo as well. So you hear, like, an LFO on the pad. That's being modulated by tempo, and also the delays on the instruments is is modulated by uh, by tempo, so that speeds up. Yeah, the pitch shifts while you do the temperature. Yeah, so it it creates this sense of uh, pit of like slow down and and speed up, which is kind of neat. I don't know, this could be useful. You know, whatever. So yeah, okay. I think that's good. Questions. <laughs> um, so I had one question, Dan. Um, yeah. So. First of all, how long did it take you to to build this? And have you built something similar in Max or PD before? And did you notice any areas where it was a lot easier or a lot more difficult? So I, you're going to be disappointed, but so I, I, <laughs> I have no Max or, or PD experience um, making this. 
it, so the question was, um, cause Aaron can't hear you guys. The question was, um, how long did this take to create? And, uh, did I notice anything that would be more like easier or more frustrating as compared to PD or max? I, I can answer that. So Aaron's going to go, you're going to shoot that one. So I don't, Dan wrote this, I would say maybe t- two or three times almost from scratch. Yeah. Cause I kept saying, cause I was like reviewing and I was like, eh, I think this is too complicated. <laughs> Let's keep it simple. He had, so this is like iteration three and I yeah. think it took him maybe about a week, two weeks. Uh, I think total. Yeah. All three different types was about a week or yeah. two. Yeah. We, we, you would be uh, maybe not surprised to find out that at Epic, uh, we have a million things going on. I had actually planned on doing a whole, you know, artistic piece myself. I had this grand vision of a, of a thing, but I just didn't have time for this presentation. So it's actually not that bad to do the kind of things that Dan did relative to, um, scripting in max and PD, obviously DSP is not supported. So, if, so ignoring that comparison and just thinking about, uh, logic, like, um, music logic, I think a uh, uh, blueprint actually has a whole bunch of things that help you in your compositional process, typing, you know, clarity on variables, uh, interfaces, the debugging is really useful. Uh, the, uh, context menu things. So like, you know, Max has a good context, sort of context menu thing now a little bit, but it's a little bit different. Like you have, I, when I'm Max programming, I'm almost always loading up the object eight, like documentation to remind myself what methods our inputs and things like that. Obviously there's people who are experts in Max and PD and can code, you know, a thousand objects a second on a stage or whatever. So in that, in that way for live, live coding, it's, it's not the same, like I said earlier. So I'd say it's comparable and I find blueprint really fun to write music in. So I think this, I think this iteration probably took me like two days, but I had already built a foundation of some of the things that I wanted to do. Like, I was building that function library as I was going, and so there were lots of useful functions, yeah. problems that I had solved in advance uh, because of that. Also, on that note, um, there are certain things that we, that Dan and I and uh, others at Epic have ambition. Um, so it's really easy to make new plugins in UE4, um, and I encourage you guys to, if you're if you're out there and you have if you didn't like the way Dan did his procedural music or whatever, and you're like, well, I've got a way better way. You could totally make a blueprint library as a plugin and then sell that on our Unreal Engine marketplace and and you know convince the world of your approach to procedural music as superior. Um, you could totally do that. There's like a whole path to that, um, and uh, I think you can even probably make money. I think there's a there there is a, a path for that sort of thing. Um, and uh, uh, so yeah, you 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 could create a library to make do a lot of the things that Dan is doing but just like sort of set it up once so you don't have to keep doing it for every composition. That's a good question. Any other questions? I have two questions. One is can in the timeline object can you modulate a point? And the other question is what was the what is the CPU overhead in processing that? That okay. okay, so the question the questions are in timelines, can you modulate a, a point, a value, I assume is like I set something in advance and then I want to change that, right? And then the other question is what's the CPU overhead? Yeah. Um so the uh to the first question, um timelines are uh so one of the things that you can do in timelines um is you can actually uh, set curves. So we have the curve itself, like, uh, where was my, uh, oh yeah, here's the break effect. It's just a simple curve, right? Um, and I just play this in forward or backward. Um, so this curve uh, is, uh, could potentially be a, an asset itself. So you can actually define curves separate from the timeline and you can use them in all different kinds of places in fact you can even use them in sound attenuation objects so you can create your own custom curves which could be any sort of weird crazy thing and then you can actually add them to your timeline in your execution path so you can actually just um yeah so we we actually are we have a synthesizer that we're prototyping um uh based on curves 
essentially like custom weight table synthesis with curve blending and all that kind of stuff. UE4 curves are pretty powerful. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, modulating an event, I think the, the easiest, the best way to do that is kind of what I've done, which is to change the playback rate and the length of the uh, timeline. Um, but uh, if you want to do a crazy procedural event system, I would probably just not use a timeline. Yeah. Yeah. You can you could use like delays and, and count count your ticks and stuff like that. Uh, and the other question was CPU. Uh, yeah. So the Dan in this particular case, Dan's running like five or six synthesizers, yeah. and uh, the CPU is uh, looks like at about twenty thirty percent, which is probably higher than what you'd want for a AAA game. But uh, <laughs> you know. So I wouldn't necessarily go and say that like Paragon or game Paragon is going to go and have a bunch of real time synthesis. It's one of those things where it's a direction that we want to take things. The this is on a brand new audio engine, so uh, you know like literally completely new. So I haven't spent a ton of time looking at optimizations and you know things like that. It it, it runs obviously it's working with five six synthesizers. So if the code's out there, so you can go totally go out there and critique it and say what the hell are you doing? This is not <laughs> efficient. But uh, but uh, the theory is is that uh, UE4 is used in a lot of indie games, um, and for an indie indie game, they have lots of CPU uh, like what's the word headroom, you know, like a 2D retro style game is not necessarily t clocking their CPU to the max, so they could potentially afford doing five or six real time synthesizers. So that's sort of the direction of what we're encouraging with this. But I wouldn't say that if you're making a triple A game that's, you know, pushing the limits on graphics and, you know, rendering and tons of stuff, you it's basically, like I said, UE4 and Blueprint is a rope generation machine. And obviously real time synthesis is a really thick, really long rope. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, doesn't, you know, like I said, all of this stuff that we talked about besides the real time synthesis is you know, you could do the same thing with sample playback. It just won't have the same right. sort of like, you know, real time, you know, custom crazy filtering and stuff. Like Although the new audio engine does have this DSP filters and source effects and submix effects. So you can get a lot of that with samples uh, and just regular playback. Uh, so you can get close if you if you need to be more optimal. I would probably say for a triple A, one more point on that topic, so I can't hear if yeah. I interrupted somebody. No. I would say that probably for a triple A game, I would say that a like one or two synthesizers is probably a reasonable thing to expect to be able to use. So I would use it on things like you know procedural UI design or player effects, like and you could you know <clears> basic. <throat> there isn't a lot of profiling tools. As the next focus of the next year is to add more real time profiling. And one of those is probably going to be synth, real-time synth budgets. So you could say, like, only allow two or three at a time and prioritize it. And then you could imagine uh, hooking it up to saying, like, a player's, <coughs> like, the local player's effects. And then uh, for non-local players, maybe switch to a sample-based thing. Mm -hmm. But so that the local player has precise procedural control of how their characters interact. So you imagine, like, a magic spell, you know, thing that has, like, really cool visual locally. And you could have that as a synthesizer component or maybe even a layer that sounds more procedural and then blend it with more traditional approaches. So that's how I'm envisioning AAA might be able to use real-time synthesis at the moment. But uh, one of the, the sort of philosophies that I have in game audio um, is that uh, you certainly won't get CPU budget if you're not doing really cool stuff. So uh, if you can prove that you're doing really, really awesome shit, like real-time procedural synthesis, and it's really making a huge benefit on the quality of the product, then you'll get more budget given to you overall so you know 20 percent cpu for a game for audio is pretty high but if you're doing badass shit you might be able to convince the people above you to say like hey man like that's actually really cool we should do that thank you yeah man Any yeah um you briefly show um the oscillator object and how you can have presets right yeah and, but because blueprints work only after compiling them. How can I actually preview the tone that I'm making in the yeah? Side? So I without, think, without without building think, a UMG and, and and you know right and attaching all the parameters so I can I can create my own sliders. Like how do I just quickly? I, the question is uh, if I'm editing my if I'm editing my preset in real time. How can I, you know, access that the preset data that I've created, and that's kind of something we've we've been sort of 
You mean serializing your real-time settings? <laughs> right. So yeah. you can um, – it, it doesn't do it out of the box, but you can basically – there is a way for you to, from runtime, serialize your your data and then reuse it later. Um, I don't, off the top of my head, you probably like we'd have to probably make some C plus plus objects that take that and then serialize it into a new object. Um, it's totally doable. Uh, in fact, uh, I added support in uh, for the sequencer to do like input recorded audio. Sequencer is a whole separate tool that we have for cinematic sequences and stuff. And a year ago, we did a big uh, demo at SIGGRAPH, and I wrote the you know the ability for the tool to record straight from microphone into the sequencer tool. And that's a runtime thing uh, in the editor that actually serializes an asset. So I've done that before, um, and it's not that big of a deal. You just have to create a new object and stuff. So what you'd end up having to do is to create some kind of a function that's like save and then taking that value and making a new object off of the current settings. It's totally doable. It's not out of the box right now, but you could easily add that ability yourself for your own stuff. I think we've also been flirting with the idea of, of giving uh, the presets that, or the synths that we create uh, more uh, easier to use interface. Oh yeah. The, so, the one of the things that um, are you guys looking at us or the screen still? Uh, you, but we can switch. I can't tell. Yeah, he, they're looking at us. They're looking at us. Yeah. Okay, I think he's we're, switching we're over. Back on, we're back on so the screen, uh, in the widget stuff, I just wanted to show you yeah. if, you, if you switch over, uh, like you got to do it in this space. Yeah, um, that's like not a good example. Uh, synth. So I for, so if you if you guys saw our GDC presentation, um, Dan built this ridiculous. UMG interface um, that wraps the center synthesizer so that we could demo the idea of the synthesizer without a giant U struct that has like 600 parameters. Um, so Dan built this whole thing based off of this. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, if it's square, you can size the content. It actually looks good. Uh, but anyways, so this is a uh, sort of total synthesizer knob that I wrote quickly for the GDC demo. <laughs> Um, it's out there in the 4.16 version, um, but basically you can extend and create your own uh, custom widgets. And we didn't have a knob, like a rotary knob widget. And, you know, for synthesizers, you really need that. So there's a whole bunch of sh stuff already built in, slider, all this kind of – I made a synth 2D slider. It's a bug that it's up here in common. It should be down here in synth. But anyways, um, so you can create your own UI, and uh, it's a really powerful thing if you wanted to sort of – create your own custom stuff. But anyways, this is UMG, which is sort of a U object wrapper around, as I mentioned before, another API called Slate. You can think of Slate as like the DSP, like hardcore native code. And UMG is a sort of U object wrapper that exposes it to Blueprint. My uh, synthesizer class is a U object wrapper around a pure C++ synthesizer, which is how I'd recommend you guys doing it. If you're going to write your own synthesizers, do all of your synthesis code in your own code base link it to a DLL even, you can arbitrarily load DLLs in UE4 and just wrap, like do U-object wrapping around your synthesizer. Um, but anyways, so with the widgets and Slate and stuff like that all have that same sort of paradigm. And so all of this UI, the entire editor is built off of that sl Slate framework, which ex uh, opens up the idea of having custom visualization in the editor for audio sort of parameters. So instead of having all this auto-generated UI stuff, like all this stuff is, like uh, like Dan's, um, just to show you, where, do you have a uh, synth, synth banks? banks yeah. yeah. So like this is all auto-generated UI. Um, this looks ugly like shit, right? But it, it's possible where I could go like this and then see a synthesizer, like just like you would in a, in a, in a VST or something like that. Like this could become your synth interface and we customize how this looks. It's very possible to do that. We just haven't done that work, but it's a direction we'd like to go. So things look nicer and more intuitive and that kind of a thing. Um, <clears throat> Cause Slate can do literally anything. It's a full fledged, you know, U UI framework. Any other we, we're also looking in the future uh, to uh, do we have submixes? Yeah. Uh, let's see which this guy. Uh, that's effect. This is a, so if you go to uh, this is Dan's submix graph. This is a little graph editor. It's really basic right now, but we want we want to take this to uh, where these nodes aren't ugly like this, but actually with uh, you know feedback on you know the levels, 
uh, monitoring, all kinds of stuff. So you could actually make this beautiful and and useful. This is just like the bare minimum to have a submix graph and allow you to edit it. So like right now when I click this, it just goes and shows you the submix effects. It'd be great if you could in line here see the effect and visualize it and edit it and things like that in a, in a way that you would in a DAW. But this is all just auto, auto, you know, C++, U object reflection. It's really ugly. <laughs> um, but that's sort of where we want to take things. On this note, can, can I also ask if you guys are planning on having decibels and semitones instead of zero one scale? Do you have any questions? Yeah, there's a question. Uh, he's asking about uh, uh, decibel and semitone values instead of pitch and volume yeah, so, scale of values. Um, I, so I'm the first uh, audio programmer to work at Epic that is an actual audio programmer. Um, prior to me, to you know, me working here, all the audio code was done through talented programmers, but not necessarily audio people. And so it makes sense to have a volume scaler, uh, not in decibels from a pure, like, you know, low level point of view. So why not just think about it, you know, at the UI? So obviously it would be great if you could customize that. You could say maybe at a project or, or an editor setting to decide on how you want your volumes and then have that just across the, the board switch to volume scaler or de decibel. I actually have a change list that I just haven't checked in because it has potentially unknown implications. I've got to vet it through the editor and the blueprint team. But I have a change list that adds like U object markup to specify uh, that it is a volume scalar value and to give it the option of being displayed in decibels so that when you go to the editor, you can have that just automatically set up. Uh, but the change keeps it internally serialized as a scalar volume, but displays it to the user as a decibel. Um, and same thing with pitch. Very, very much you could do the same thing with pitch. Um, so uh, anyway, so yes, I completely agree. It's just that we have a list of like 600 things we have to do. Um, and so we, we did just hire another audio programmer, so there'll be two shortly. <laughs> there was a small cheer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? So I, is someone talking? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, I think the, the, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. yeah. I think the uh, takeaway. I just want you because I'm assuming this is a room filled with audio nerds. Um, <laughs> and uh, the takeaway here is that you know you can kind of ignore literally everything that Dan t said or or everything <laughs> we're doing. But the idea is like. If you want to get your code in UE4 natively, it's very easy for you to do that. It's very easy to make your own Blueprint APIs. You know, so UE4 is a thing that you could, if you wanted to get your audio chops in more directly into uh, games in the world of games, this is a possibility for you to check out. It's sort of the TLDR, you know? And, and, if you, and if you do anything cool or find any bugs in my code, just let me know. Go to the forums. <laughs> Yeah, totally check out the forums. Uh, there are some guides that I've posted that kind of describe how to get started with all the new stuff that that uh, have been implemented and uh, and also building a, a MIDI manager, sort of getting started with that too. Oh, somebody asked also, but I, someone mentioned about open sound control. So as point in the point in that, on my last point talking about extending UE4, there is a uh, open sound control plugin that you just cite, you know, Google search UE4 OSC, and you'll find a highly, you know, people use it all the time. And I, I've seen projects where people use that plugin. Both, it's cool that, that that exists. You can make your own plugin. If you have some crazy idea, just make a plugin. Um, but people are using that plugin to do a kind of like uh, inter process communication thing with like UE4 and Max or something like that. I've seen lots of projects doing that. And probably if I was a graduate student, again, doing a cool synthesis project in VR or whatever, I'd probably go that route and and not spend any time learning Blueprint because screw it, I already know Max. Um, what I'm saying is that that's a really terrible workflow, and I think Blueprint actually is a better environment for doing that kind of thing versus just bypassing even having to learn about it and doing an OSC hook into everything. So I, I recommend people actually checking out native capabilities, not just in the audio engine, but Blueprint in general. Um, And since we are here, sorry, <laughs> again, it's, it's always me. Um, otherwise, I'm going to ask you on UE, UDN form anyway. 
Um, you know, this is unrelated to the synthesis and procedural audio, but it's unreal stuff. You know the concatenator object in sound. <laughs> When, yeah. when are we going to get sample accurate transitions between the different um, sounds that you're concatenating? Because right now, you know what I mean? It's probably not going to look like a sound cue. So he's asking about the concatenator node in sound cues. What about it? He wants sample accurate uh, concatenation. Yeah. So, the, so sound cues are, um, I guess I'm going to officially go on the record saying are kind of an abomination. Um, so sound cues are, are it, it would you the way they're constructed would imply that it's some kind of DSP type graph or something, but it's actually executed on the game thread and the timing is not, it's literally evaluated every game thread tick, um, the graph is evaluated from scratch every game thread tick and what it does is it, is it for each sound cue it it builds a list of potential sounds which may or may not play. So for example, the mixer node in sound cue is not mixing at all. It's playing multiple sounds. It'll actually play multiple source voices. So it'll take it'll consume up your, you know, your voice channel count. Um, and similarly the concatenator node is literally the way that works is that it plays a sound, registers in the code to get a delegate notification when the sound finishes. And then it plays another note on that, so it, or not a note, but a, a voice. So it'll kind of chain through that. But that all happens on the game thread. There is no connection to DSP. Now you have to rem remember that it was only until literally a couple months ago, or actually 4.16, which is barely even out yet. You it's know? not even out technically. Um, and 4.15 was it, where it was the first time where there was like an actual custom, you know, audio DSP render. All of the old audio engine for 20 years was implemented by lower level audio APIs like X audio two very deeply or NGS two on PS four or all these. So there wasn't a lot of ability, uh, especially expertise on audio in terms of the audio programming to even know how to access the audio stream. And so sound cues is kind of like a, a, a in the direction of doing DSP type stuff, but it's not really, it's more of a sound sequencer. So you should think of the sequencer node and all those kinds of things as like replacement for what you probably should be doing in blueprint. So, I think the direct. I would like to maybe in the future reevaluate sound cues and actually make that a DSP graph, you know, and actually do sort of MSP type things in sound cue in the future, so you can build your own actual DSP and synthesizers in the sound cue things. That's the primary. That's like a good place for that. And in that case, then I could do a DSP level sample accurate concatenator node type thing, right? So, um, uh, in the meantime, I recommend. Um, Minima like if you're going to try to implement audio in a game, if there's like game audio people in the audience or listening to this later, I recommend using sound cues as a way to get basic variation like sample variation and volume modulation and pitch modulation. But to avoid using sound cues as much as you can for any kind of non-trivial uh, interaction with the game, because um, in other words, like if you're doing some kind of complex state based sound design system, maybe you're building a dynamic ambience or you want to create some kind of distance based thing or get game logic and do any any time any type of thing where you're going to think about doing what what's in wise called an RTPC, like a real time parameter control, any kind of thing where you're like, I need to feed sound my sound cue some crazy game state and then deal with the logic in the sound cue. If you're I would recommend not doing that and doing that logic straight up in Blueprint because sound cues predate Blueprint by like 10 years, 15 years. So sound cues used to be the only way where you could do that kind of complex logic because uh, Unreal Script is much less capable than Blueprint. But Blueprint has surpassed sound cues and capabilities now. And you have you know real-time debugging. You have all of the power of that we just talked about for Blueprint. And so you can instance things, you can, you know, all the things that you could possibly want to do for sound design in complex sound design, you can do in blueprint. And I recommend that as the path. And I, I'm in terms of doing the day-to-day uh, -day sort of randomization and volume and pitch modulation and that kind of stuff, I'm looking at going into a direction of creating sort of uh, audio containers. So uh, similar to maybe how Wise thinks about things where you, where you collect your, your basic behaviors that you want 95% of your sounds to deal with and do that easily and quickly and not have to build a whole crazy graph. Like, so if you want to have, for example, like five variations with each of those variations having randomized volume and pitch, that's five, 10, 15, 16, 17 nodes probably to build in a crazy node graph versus, you know, just, you could just have a data structure that defines it, you know? <clears throat> Any other 
questions? I think we're going to wrap it up, man. Yeah, I think yeah. that's it. Yeah. Anything. They just clapped. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 -bye.